the turn of the millennium, and over half a century of hostilities between Palestinians and Israelis had reached new heights. A wave of deadly terror attacks by Palestinian militants swept through Israel. Israel responded with the full force of its military might. In 2002, Israel decided to build a wall, a wall to stop the killings and restore peace. But the wall has bred division and hatred on both sides. Today, this is one of the most volatile borders on Earth. This is one of the holiest lands on Earth, the birthplace of three of the world's major religions and a place where Jews, Christians and Muslims worship side by side. It's a land that for generations has triggered bloodshed. Whilst some have tried to ease the tensions, others have fueled the conflict. It is time to officially recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. In the aftermath of the Second World War, the UN voted to partition Palestine between Arabs and Jews. And in May 1948, the State of Israel was created. It was the culmination of millennia of Jewish aspirations. The Jewish nation would possess more than half of Palestine, though they made up less than half the population. After two years of fierce civil war, Israel expanded its territory and an armistice was agreed in 1949. A fragile border between Palestine and Israel was drawn, the so-called Green Line. Both nations have been uneasy neighbors ever since, and many lives have been lost in the Arab-Israeli conflict. But the roots of today's tensions lie in the 1967 Six-Day War, when Israel captured the West Bank and Gaza. Israel maintains its military occupation of the West Bank, an area home to 2.5 million Palestinians. At the turn of the millennium, the Second Intifada, or uprising, ushered in a new dark chapter in the conflict, claiming hundreds of innocent lives on both sides. In 2002, after dozens of suicide bombings, Israel decided to build a wall. As an Israeli, you can live your life without any knowledge of the wall. You drive to work in the morning to Jerusalem, you see a wall that looks pretty nice, doesn't, doesn't bother us at all. You go through a checkpoint pretty comfortably. You can be an Israeli and you can have absolutely positively no awareness of what the wall means to the other side. When completed, 700 kilometers of towering concrete and steel wall will encircle the West Bank. It's bold and imposing. It's also deemed illegal. In 2004, the International Court of Justice concluded that the wall breached international humanitarian law. It demanded that Israel stop building the barrier and tear down what had already been built. But Israel considered the wall essential to protect its people. The suicide bombings had fallen by 90%. Israel ignored the court order. 
the wall would stay. לפעמים, בגלל כל מעשי הרצח וכדומה, אז עושים לנו דברים שאין לנו ברירה, זה לא טוב, בגלל, כדי להגן ממעשי רצח, ויש לצערנו לא מעט, אולי, אינני יודע, יכול להיות שאין ברירה, אינני יודע. Here, south of Jerusalem, in the little town of Bethlehem, the wall is having a devastating effect on people's lives. It snakes through the town, separating people from their schools, families, workplaces, and hospitals. The most deprived area of this town is Aida. Many Palestinians arrived here as refugees in 1948. Born and raised in the camp, Dr. Abdel Fattah Abu Srur remembers what life was like here before the wall. Only around a fifth of the wall follows the Green Line, the controversial border between Israel and the West Bank. 85% of the wall's route cuts into Palestinian lands, in some places encircling Jewish settlements built by Israel on Palestinian lands. أبوي ورث أبوي عن جدي وهذا الزيتون قديم عمره أكثر من ألفين سنة يعني قبل المسيح وكان هذا يعطينا مغلول وغل من الزيت والزيتون يعني دخل إضافي للعائلة. In 2015 in Beit Jala near Bethlehem, an area famed for its olives. 30 Israeli soldiers arrived with machine guns and bulldozers and began uprooting the olive trees to make way for the wall. وممنوع اني اقربهم لقيت الجرافات عماله بتخلع وبتقطع باشجار زيتون وهذه الاشجار مثل ما حكيت اشجار يعني عمرها مش صغير عمر 2000 سنه مش بالساهل انه تنخلع ولكن هذه الجرافات الضخمه اللي احضروها كانت يعني تخلعها مثل ما تخلع شتلة ورد وحضروني إني أكرب قلت لهم هذه الأرض أرضي وأنا بدي أدخل أشوف أرض شو بتعملوا فيها كان هذه مش أرضك هذه أنت من بيت جالة هذه أرض أصبحت اليوم للقدس القدس إحنا حط مستولين عليها Palestinian lawyers from the Society of St. Eves have fought the expansion of the wall in Bethlehem through the Israeli courts Israel has a great sense of entitlement and it's driven by an incredibly power-drunk politics. I mean, look, if you're concerned about your security, you have to implement the wall on your borders. So when you're implementing it in a very strategic way that takes the fertile land, the resources, it's of course not about security anymore. Jewish and Arab people had lived in these lands side by side for generations. Following the 1967 Six-Day War, Israel had brought more than one million Palestinians under their control. This was the beginning of Israel's occupation of the Palestinian territories that continues to this day. For religious Jews, their victory was a miracle from God. The vast land of Israel that had been promised to them in the Bible had become a reality. And they started to build settlements on the occupied lands in defiance of international law. They are a major source of dispute between Israel and the Palestinians. Here we are, half hour south of Jerusalem, 
it's really uh, powerful living here. So many different uh, biblical stories took place here. We learn Bible around here, not just by sitting in the classroom, but we take the book, the Bible, put it in our backpack, go outside, you read the verses, you walk in the footsteps of the forefathers, you see where it happened, and you know that you are the next page in the Bible. You are continuing Jewish history after a 2,000 year hiatus, 2,000 years of being on the sidelines, we're back. Today, there are over 150 settlements in the West Bank, with over half a million residents. And the expansion continues. South of Jerusalem lies Gush Etzion settlement block, home to 75,000 people. It was the first settlement built in the occupied West Bank. One of the first buildings here was the Yeshivat Har Etzion. Today it's housed in this striking modernist building inspired by Mount Sinai, where Moses received the Ten Commandments. This yeshiva is one of only 40 throughout Israel and the occupied territories that combines intense religious study with rigorous military service. These students have a reputation for being the most committed soldiers. One day I did something that uh, I felt very guilty in doing. I walked into the study and I closed the door and I went to my computer and I sat down and I typed into the Google search bar after looking over my shoulder to make sure no one was looking. I typed in Israeli occupation of Palestine. I remember the moment. And I got to all these leftist websites that a good Orthodox rabbi, settler Jew like me should never be caught dead reading. And I read them all. And I didn't recognize any of the names of the websites. And most of what I read was directed against me, against the settlers, against the Jews who've crossed over the Green Line, gone into Palestinian territory, and stolen the land of the Palestinians. I rejected much of what I read because it was borderline anti-Semitic. Part of what I read, even though it was directed against me, part of it penetrated my soul and I saw its truth. The most significant thing I see on the other side of the fence would be that there's no monster there. <laughs> there are people there that are just like me. <laughs> they have uh, the same beliefs and same aspirations. Uh, we call God a different name, but our religion is very similar in a lot of aspects. The values that we believe in are very similar. And it seems <laughs> for me the most shocking thing about the other side of the fence is that there's a human being there and, and they want a normal life just like I do. In schools here, neither sides are taught, not Hebrew and nor uh, Arabic. Every Israeli needs to go when he's 18 to the army and he's gonna meet, for sure, a Palestinian person and he can't talk to him. So of course he's gonna be afraid of him. Of course he's gonna think he's a terrorist. He can't even talk to him. This is the power of the story because they are brainwashed. They are going through a socializing process that is aimed to prepare them to be able to sacrifice their lives when time comes on both sides. This is being done by hiding the other side and demonizing the other side, dehumanizing the other side in a very, very systematic process of two nations which are in war and they need to prepare the warriors of the next collision. The only sentence I knew um, in Arabic was the one I learned 
back then in the army and the meaning of that sentence is stop or I'm gonna shoot because the whole idea <laughs> is is that I'm defending and if somebody's coming and gonna kill me I need I need to defend myself after leaving the Israeli army Raz joined forces with Rabbi Hanan to promote dialogue between Palestinians and Israeli settlers the charity roots offers opportunities for both sides to talk face to face. But the simple act of meeting people from the other side is fraught with difficulty and danger. Both societies, um, especially in the Palestinian side, are so not ready for this that it really might hurt them. It really can put their life in danger if we film them, if they, somebody sees their faces, hears their name, even knows that, that they're going to some sort of thing of like, like that with, with Israelis, moreover, like with settlers. So it can really put their life in danger. We are in the process of ignoring each other. It's so stupid, you know, they say the wall has stopped terrorism. It's not true. The main purpose of it is to build the fear in the hearts of people to make the other side a risk. When you are afraid of something, you will come closer. And if you won't come closer, you won't know. And if you won't know, you have no interest of changing the situation. And it's built on fear, it's built on terror, it's built on ignorance. And the world does not bring peace. The world does not bring trust. The world brings anger, especially when you build the wall, not on your territory, but in the living room of your neighbor. He, he will hate you for it. To the north of Gush Etzion is the fertile valley of Wadi Fukin. For generations, Arab farmers have grown produce here to sell in the market stalls of Bethlehem and beyond. This rich, fertile land was famed for its high-quality produce and provided the Palestinian farmers with good income. But now the breadbasket of the West Bank is under threat. Wadi Fukin lies in the shadow of one of Israel's largest and most rapidly growing settlements, the ultra-Orthodox Beitar Elite. طبعا يعني احنا بنعيش ماساه حقيقيه بشكل يومي لما كل صباح بنطلع فيه بنسمع هاي الاليات الاسرائيليه اللي بتشتغل بشكل يومي بنشعر بمستقبل صعب يعني لنا ولاطفالنا في المستقبل هذا الاحتلال بيهدد كل شيء في حياتنا بيهدد حريتنا بيهدد حقوقنا في استخدام اراضينا the natural water springs here have been polluted by wastewater and sewage from the settlement on the hilltops. The villagers are fighting to keep hold of what remains of their land. مستقبل المستوطنات في قرية ودفكين راح يحول هاي القرية لسجن لعبارة عن جزيرة محاطة بالمستوطنات من جميع الجهات اليوم موجود في بتار عليت أكثر من ستين ألف مستوطن ولكن متوقع إنه التوسع الاستيطان الموجود في هاي المنطقة من جميع الجهات من ناحية الشمالية ومن ناحية الجنوبية ومن ناحية الشرقية ومن ناحية الغربية يوصل عدد المستوطنين في خلال سنوات قريبة لأكثر من 250 ألف مستوطن Over the last 70 years, Israel has taken three quarters of this valley. Before the turn of the century, more than 1,200 sheep and goats roamed these hills. Today, there are fewer than 200. Villagers here feel powerless to stop the expansion. Jamila and Hassan Manasara have farmed this valley for nearly 70 years. A few years ago when they lived in the village, they received notice that Israel planned to confiscate their land to build a wall to secure the settlements. Wadi Fukin 
Both in their 80s, they left their home in the village to live in a cave on their land. It was a desperate attempt to keep hold of their property. Wadi Fukin has seen its population decline as young people leave in search of work. Many who have stayed have to resort to working in the construction of the Israeli settlements all around them. Villagers here see the wall as a silent notice of eviction. I'm a Jew and I'm a Zionist, I'm a settler, and I'm deeply connected to Jewish history and to this land. But at the same time, I'm able to stop building my identity on the foundations of someone else's lack of existence. And I'm able to begin to see that Palestinians are real, they exist, they're human beings, and they also have a place in this land just like, just like mine. In 1993, Direct talks between Israel and Palestine raised hopes of an end to the conflict. But the Oslo Agreement came at a high price for Palestinians. It split the West Bank into three administrative zones. Area A, under full Palestinian control. Area B, where Palestinians run their own civil affairs, but Israelis control the security. And Area C, which is under total Israeli control. Area C accounts for 60% of the West Bank. The arrangement was intended to be temporary. A quarter of a century on, it's still in place. Almost all of Wadi Fukin falls within Area C, and villagers live under strict Israeli control. When we're talking about regulations and laws that relate to planning, Palestinians cannot build on their very own property. And for a Palestinian to build on his own land, he will have to refer to the Israeli authorities to get a, a building permit. And when they do, I can tell you that chances of getting a proper uh, building permit, an Israeli one, is slim to none. Now, when people do build anyway because they need to, the final outcome is always a demolition order. People living under military occupation means they have no rights, they have no representation. They have no freedom of movement. They have no recourse. If something happens, who are they going to go to? The police are against them, the army is against them. They don't have anyone that represents them. With the current incredibly right-wing Israeli government and the incredibly right-wing judiciary, the life of a Palestinian couldn't be any more worthless. In the holy city of Bethlehem, pilgrims flock here from all over the world to visit the birthplace of Jesus. The city lies within Area A, but even here, the occupation has had a devastating effect. Visitor numbers are down, and it has the highest unemployment rate in the West Bank. Bethlehem is encircled by Israeli settlements and the wall snakes through the city center. On the northern edge is the Aida refugee camp. Created after the 1948 partition, it's now home to 5,500 people. The camp is overcrowded and living conditions are poor. Almost completely surrounded by the wall, it's a place of simmering tensions between Palestinians and the ever-present Israeli forces. Dr. Abdel Fattah Abu Sror was born and raised in the camp. He knows the effect that occupation has on those around him. Today, he works with young people of Aida to offer hope and new opportunities. In 1998, he established the Arawad Center. The legacy of violence in the West Bank has had a profound effect on children, with increasing numbers showing signs of psychological distress. Before a few 
اللي قال بده يكون دكتور مهندس محامي استاذ صحفي ممرض الى اخره ثلاث اطفال ثمان سنين تسع سنين 12 او 13 سنه قالوا بدنا نموت فبالتالي يكون عندك اطفال ثمان تسع سنين 12 سنه 13 سنه بيقولوا بدنا نموت يعني ها شيء صادم ليش ليش بدكم تموتوا فكانوا ما حدا مهتم يعني الاسرائيليين بدخلوا بيحتلوا بدمروا البيت بيعتقلوا اخوي ابن عمي الى اخره وما حدش سال Many of the children who attend this center have experienced tear gas, home invasions, and family members, in some cases as young as five years old, detained by the Israeli forces. My name is Siwar, and I'm 11, and I'm going to study for the children and play, and I'm going to die. So the war is going to affect us, so we're going to die for the children. نمرح وناخذ طفلتنا شوي بعيد عن الاحتلال واحنا جايين ناخذ مسرح لحتى كمان نقدم حالنا للناس ويشوفونا ويتعرفوا علينا كمان الاطفال بيحاولوا يعيشوا طفوله حتى لو كانت مش طبيعيه لكن في نفس الوقت بيحاولوا انه يقبضوا على اي فرحه عشان هيك يعني وجود الرواد واستقباله للاطفال و... وهاي المساحه اللي بياخذوها عشان يعبروا عن حالهم عبر المسرح عبر الدبكه عبر الموسيقى عبر التصوير الى اخره عبر كل الامكانيات اللي بتعطيهم انهم يطلعوا اللي جواهم بأجمل الطرق ويبنوا السلام جواهم Since it was first built, the wall has been a canvas for Palestinians to express their fury and frustration. It's also drawn artists from around the world who've come armed with spray cans and stencils to leave their mark on the concrete. The wall has become an open-air art gallery. The most famous graffiti is found in Bethlehem, where Banksy, the reclusive British street artist, has painted iconic murals resisting the occupation. Enterprising Palestinians have been quick to seize on the opportunities offered by this new tourist attraction. But Israel considers painting the wall illegal. معنا الجدار فالجدار انا بالنسبه لي فيش له معنى وفيش عندي جدران بالعقل اللي انا حامله يعني انا اجيت قررت اجي اشتغل جنب الجدار اوكي لانه فيش شغل لفنان جنب الا جنب الجدار يعني هو الفرصه الوحيده اللي بتقدر تطلع منها على العالم وبتشوف ناس بتتعرف على ناس تتعلم لغه بتشوف فن الناس كمان مش بس انه بتشتغل يعني هو الخطر باي مكان اول شيء ولما تشوفي جندي جاي عليك بسلاح او بقوه هو حاملها وهو فيش عنده مخ بفكر انه هذا البني ادم برسم او او بيشتغل جنب الجدار حتى يعيش هو بفكر هيك طبعا هو بفكر انه معاه مصدر قوه اللي هو السلاح اللي هو حامله artists painting the wall have to be vigilant israeli soldiers have been spotted in the area this painting will have to be finished another day. In the West Bank, the concrete wall is broken in places by some 500 roadblocks and checkpoints. Israel maintains they're essential to protect its citizens from terrorist attacks. For Palestinians, they represent yet another way in which the Israeli military control their lives. Checkpoint 300 is one of the busiest in the West Bank. It's the main crossing point between Bethlehem and Jerusalem. With high unemployment, tens of thousands of Palestinians are forced to look on the other side of the wall for work. 
the little contact there is, is in work. Palestinians come to do menial labor, but that's not a relationship. That's a hierarchical relationship. Real relationships are one in a thousand. The wall is a major, major presence in their lives, and it symbolizes for them the Israeli intention and effort and act of closing them off, of denying them freedom of movement. Uh, my Palestinian friends say that living in Bethlehem is like living in a big jail. There are more than a hundred types of permits issued by the Israeli military authority. Permits to study and travel abroad, to pray at Jerusalem's holy sites, permits to visit relatives, permits for medical treatment, or to attend a wedding or funeral. But even with a permit, entry is not guaranteed, and checkpoints can close at a moment's notice. This is what an occupation is. It has a negative effect and influence on your daily life choices. This is the ugly face of the occupation that, you know, Western countries don't want to see. Around 11,000 Palestinians have been forced to obtain permits to live in their own homes. The wall also separates Palestinians from one another. On the outskirts of Bethlehem is the Palestinian town of Al Walaja. In autumn 2017, Omar Hajjajla and his family were cut off from the rest of the village by the wall. Now he's only able to access his home and see his friends and relatives by passing through this tunnel. And for that, he needs a permit. Whilst filming, Israeli soldiers arrived to put up the CCTV cameras and fix the gate locks, and we were asked to stop filming with Omar. Because they're working, you're not supposed to be close to them. He wants you to go behind that, um, where you see the light, uh, behind the car, and that you are not allowed to film closer than that. The Palestinians live in their cages, unable to go out in any way. The Israelis are sitting in their coffee houses, drinking coffee. They don't want to know what is going on down their noses, 200 meters behind their backs. They prefer not to know. The Israeli media is cooperating with this. And the whole uh, situation is like um, a false paradise, bubble, if you like. Bassam Aramin grew up in the ancient city of Hebron, the scene of some of the conflict's bloodiest clashes. Like most of his friends, he became a stone thrower. He called himself a freedom fighter. If you are a Palestinian, you don't need education to hate at all. You don't need school books. Just leave your home, go outside. Sometimes open the window to smell the tear gas. This is the big educator, the big teacher. At the age of 16, we find some uh, other weapons with two grenades and Kalashnikov, uh, with other military materials that we don't know how to use it. But two of my friends uh, uh, throw the two grenades in the Israeli patrols. And of course, in that time, no one killed, no one injured, because they don't know how to use it in a professional way. Bassam was jailed for seven years. It was a profound experience that changed his whole outlook on the conflict. From the beginning, I was a friend with a, an Israeli guard because, you know, something strange happened in the personal level. For me, it was a tool of struggle to convince him that I am a human being. I want him to show my heart, to see my heart. I am not a killer. We start to talk when I say to him, let us talk. If you convince me, that's it. It takes a few months until we become very close friends. And he started to treat us in a human way, in a different way. Uh, 
to respect us. He understand that we are not settlers, we are not occupiers. I am not a killer. I was a kid and I found myself as a warrior or a fighter. And he's ready to live in peace in that time, which was a big achievement for me. Uh, you know, by dialogue, I changed his mind. I was a product of the Israeli brainwashing system towards the other side that was hidden from me, deliberately, viciously. I was uh, a part of a group of people that went to war with singing on their lips and came down very, very uh, devastated. It was a very um, horrible experience. We started this war with a company of 11 tanks. We finished it with only three. And uh, the change that happened to me is uh, mainly disappointment and anger. And uh, I became an anarchist. And um, I put myself into a bubble. I was doing graphic design for the right wing, for the left wing, whoever paid me. And I tried to uh, be as cynical as I can be. And uh, I was meant to uh, go on like this for the rest of my life until uh, the bubble was blown up to millions of pieces. And I started a journey. One day in September 1997, Rami's 14-year-old daughter, Smadar, went shopping with her friends to Jerusalem. It was Thursday afternoon. Uh, I was on my way to the airport to bring my uh, wife's mother from the airport. I got a telephone call uh, saying there was, there was a a bombing in the center of Jerusalem, and someone saw Smadari goes down the uh, mall. And that's it. Long hours of uh, searching, of running in the streets, trying to find her, she vanished. And you go from uh, hospital to hospital, from police station to police station. Very long and frustrating and very uh, difficult hours until eventually, very later that night, you find yourself in the morgue. You don't cope with things like this. It's there, it will never go away, it's an open wound. Time is not a doctor, and time does not heal. Smadar was one of five people killed that day by suicide bombers. Her murder drew attention because she was the granddaughter of Mati Peled, a former general and prominent politician he became one of Israel's most radical peace activists. The murder of Smadar caught the attention of political figures from across the divide. Even the prime minister of the day, Benjamin Netanyahu. She was buried by her grandfather, whose coffin was carried by six Israeli generals, who was a personal friend of Yitzhak Rabin and uh, Shimon Peres and all these. And in his funeral, like in hers, the whole range of this fascinating Israeli society, Israelis, uh, Palestinians, Jews and Arabs, and all of them were there on the hill in Kibbutz Nachshon. It was unbelievable because it was a very rare sight. And when she was killed by the enemies of peace, it was a shock all around the world. And what uh, created this Earthquake was uh, an interview that uh, someone uh, made with Nurit, my wife. And it was the first time in the history of uh, the violence in this region that someone put the blame on the policies of the Israeli government and the occupation. It was unheard of. And it was especially unheard of because she was a classmate of Bibi Netanyahu. And uh, when he called us, uh, she said to him, it's your fault. Smadar's mother, Professor Nurit Peled El Hanan, is an academic, author, and human rights activist who is critical of the racist depiction of Palestinians and Muslims in Israeli school books. She doesn't care if people like her or love her. She doesn't care if people are listening or not listening. She tells it as it is and showed in an academic research without any connection to her personal 
disaster, what makes uh, an Israeli soldier being able to pull the trigger on a 10 years old girl? And she is banned in this country. People are not willing to listen to her. She's outcasted because uh, people are not able to look themselves in the mirror and see the image that is uh, in the mirror. After his release from prison in 1992, Bassam Aramin turned his back on the armed struggle, dedicating his life to promoting dialogue between Palestinians and Israelis. Eventually, he established Combatants for Peace, an organization of former Israeli and Palestinian fighters who lay down their weapons in favor of dialogue and peace. It took a great leap of faith for those former enemies to meet for the first time. When I look back at this meeting, it's like a dream. So we decide to lay down our weapons and we start to talk. And we have this slogan, what Nelson Mandela says, if you want to make peace with your enemy, you need to work with your enemy. Then he became your partner. So it's not only to talk to your enemy, it's to work together against your common enemy so we can live peace in uh, peace and security. As fellow former combatants turned peace campaigners, Bassam and Rami became close friends. In 2007, 10 years after Rami lost Smadar, Bassam Armin's daughter was also killed in tragic circumstances. An Israeli border police shot and killed my 10 years old daughter, Abir. Uh, she was with her sister and two other girls uh, in front of their school after they finished their exams and that day, 9.30 in the morning, uh, from a distance of 15 to 20 meters in her head from the back. Abir had just bought sweets at the shop. Three years later, Bassam came face to face with the soldier in an Israeli courtroom. This is the opening question that I want to ask this guy. Why? Why you shoot her? And whatever he says, just to have an answer. Because it was no demonstrations. I was there 10 minutes before. And I have 14 Palestinian eyewitnesses. But they are all Palestinians. Uh, you can see the stories of the uh, soldiers, there are four soldiers, each one talk about a different event at all. Uh, as I said, it's forbidden to bring this soldier to justice for many reasons. It's not only this specific case. It's, you know, it's the, uh, it's the Israeli army. It's the most moral army on earth. Uh, it's not acceptable that one of those army kill kids. Bassam and Rami had first come together as former fighters working towards peace. Now they were both bereaved fathers, determined to bring an end to violence. They became involved with the Parent Circle, an organization of Palestinian and Israeli families who've lost loved ones in the conflict. This is an, uh, a unique organization, the only organization on earth that does not seek new members. The, take, the ticket to get in is, is uh, the price is too high. There are about uh, 600 families. And what we are trying to do is to combine our forces together to use this incredible power of pain. You know, power of pain is tremendous. It's like a nuclear energy. Rami and Bassam have forged an extraordinary friendship. They travel throughout Israel and the West Bank to promote peace and reconciliation starting in the classrooms. There are no shortcuts. This is a very long and bumpy road. And the minute uh, they see me and Bassam getting into the high school class, they are not as polite and receptive as you are. It's like walking in the, the open mouth of an active volcano. And uh, they can be very, very tough. They can be very insulting. They can be very uh, powerful. And also they can listen. And I, I don't think that anyone can listen to us and stay the same.
I don't want my son to be a hero like me and to spend seven years in jail. I don't want him to throw stones because it doesn't work. It means to go to non-violent ways. It's not because you want to be gentle to those occupiers or to the other side. It's for me, for my family, my people. It doesn't work. I think both sides need help. And I feel the biggest help that we create is creating hope. You don't beat violence with violence. You beat violence with hope. And that's what we're trying to create. Every morning I run in a route in Jerusalem near my house and I see the wall. And every time it just makes my heart ache. <laughs> and I really, I dream that one day I, I won't need that wall. There will always be a crack in the wall which you can go under the wall or behind the wall or above the wall to put cracks in the wall of hatred and fear that divide these two nations today. We don't want you to be pro-Israeli or pro-Palestinians. It won't help us. We demand of you to be pro-peace. In February 2017, a brand new secretly built hotel in Bethlehem surprised even the locals when it opened its doors for the first time. The owner of the walled off hotel is the elusive British graffiti artist Banksy. The hotel makes a bold statement with dozens of Banksy's best known works on show. For now, it has helped draw attention and attract visitors to Bethlehem with the enticing offer of a chance to experience life in the shadow of the wall, if only for one night. But ultimately, for the people who live on both sides, the first steps towards living in peace can only begin when the wall comes down. I look at the killer of my daughter as a victim. He, he was not born a killer. Something made him a killer. It's my task to go down deep to the roots of this. I will say to the students in Israeli high schools, it's not enough to kill the mosquitoes. You have to dry the swamp. لانه في النهاية كآباء كبني آدمين بدنا نشوف أولادنا يكبروا ونحتفل بإنجازاتهم وحياتهم ولما يجي الوقت هم اللي مفروض يمشوا بجنازاتنا مش العكس. Thank you.